Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we're going to continue looking at the May June 2021 paper two for single award CSEC agricultural science. So last time we looked at section one, and so today we're going to be looking at section two as it contains the additional two questions number three and four. So let's just jump right in. Farmer Mary goes to Meadows for the local market. She observed her yield is low. The extension officer visits her field and indicates that the tomato plant is affected by powdery mildew. Other than decreasing yields, state two symptoms of powdery mildew in tomatoes. Okay, so one, of course, would be the whitey blotches, the whitey patches of the, the colony of, of, of the fungus, of the mildew. You'll see the whitey blotches on the leaves. And then, of course, so you might even um, extend to the fruit at times. And then, of course, the distortion in the plant. You might see some of the leaves looking a little curly, a little curl upwards in some of the leaves. The, the white patches are kind of more obvious under the leaf. So you look under the leaf, you see all the white patches. And, of course, the leaf will curl up, as I said before. Also, you might see some purple little cuts, little lesions on the leaves. And sometimes, as it pertains to the fruit, you might start to crack and harden. So there are some symptoms, some of the symptoms of powdery mildew. The next question asking us, state the name of the causative agent of powdery mildew. And so powdery mildew is caused by a fungus. It's a fungi attack on the tomato plants. All right, so how can farmer maybe control uh, powdery mildew in her tomato crops? Okay, for some farmers, it's a fungus. And so she might want to, if she's going for the chemical method, you will apply some fungicide to the plants, of course, to try and kill the fungus. But the key thing here with the fungicide is that you have to be monitoring the plants early to know when the signs start creeping up. And then you kind of try to control it with the, the, the fungicide. But if it's too far gone in terms of infection you might want to uh, remove the, the affected plants destroy them take off the leaves take off whatever the, the, the damaged parts are destroy those so it doesn't spread but even before that another method is of course you have your cultural practices where you have to prune the plants early you have to plant them proper spacing so you don't jump from one to the next easily so that's other ways of preventing of controlling powdery mildew so spacing and pruning and of course molding the plant because the ideal thing is to get ears circulating around the plant because normally mildew only propagates with a lot of moisture and stuff like that so you want to mold you want to prune early to get good ventilation another method is that you can simply purchase seeds that are resistant to powdery mildew right so you buy the proper planting material that are resistant to the powdery mildew in the first place so that might help to prevent the incidence of powdery mildew so back let's go again so the three methods you can use you can use the chemical method using fungicide with, with early detection to prevent and destroy this, the, 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 the fungus you can use cultural practices like pruning molding proper spacing in plants to prevent to give it circulation and prevent the the, the the fungus from jumping from plant to plant easily and of course you can use the proper cultivar good planting material so you buy a seed you use a seed that is somewhat resistant to the powdery mildew all right one of the easiest way for powdery mildew to spread uh, throughout her farm is wind the wind would actually Remember, remember it's a fungus and so they have spores and colonies in the spores and so the wind can easily just blow some of these spores to other plants land on the plants establish an next colony so wind is one of the ways in which powdery mildew can spread or be transmitted to mary's farm right of course you know you might latch on to you might walk to the patch you latch on to your clothing and then you rub it on another another plant that's the next way so you have all the agents that can spread these things. Wind, humans can, animals can, right? Animals can simply come, rub against the plant, leaf, and transmit it to the next one. But one of the easiest way is, of course, the wind. So that's question three. Question four. 
farmer Garona recently cleared 10 hectares of flat land and plants to produce a crop of beans. She wants to carry out only primary tillage on her field. However, her friend farmer George tells her that she also needs to do secondary tillage. State 3 advantages of primary tillage. So state 3 advantages of primary tillage. So for this one, we can simply run to our books, our textbooks if you, if you want to. And we have it right here. Advantages are benefits of primary tillage. So the first one here. Loosen or break, on, or break up the soil surface, right? So it loosen or break up the soil surface. You know, sometimes the soil may be compacted and you might want to break it up so you can allow for air and water to penetrate better. So next effect, which is what I just stated, allows air and water to enter the soil more freely. And two, it can bury or mix organic matter into the soil. So the plant, the green manure, whatever you uh, manure you have, that can be tilled into the soil with primary tillage. So those are three effects that primary tillage would have, or three advantages of primary tillage for farmer Garona. So again, loosen or break up the soil surface, allow air and water to enter the soil more freely, and bury or mix organic matter with the soil so that you till it back into the soil. At the end of primary tillage, the soil is in large clods or lumps. So that's why secondary would be most important. So to answer part two, secondary tillage, what uh said three reasons why a farmer you know, must also do secondary tillage before planting. And so we have some answers right here. To obtain a tilt suited to the crop, remember we said that after primary, you got some big lumps still. So secondary would just refine those lumps and give, give it the soil a nice tilt. So you have some nice smaller particles to work with. Two, produce a seed bed for cultivation of crops. So something may go through and the secondary tillage would actually harrow or bank, do the banking. And so you got the beds for cultivation. That's what it normally second tillage would help to do. You run through and you'll get your beds for your tillage, your, your cultivation. Then cut up and mix organic matter. Crops residue or uh, stubbles into the soil. So it further mixes and cuts it up into a, a finer pieces, the, the um, mixed organic matter into the soil. So you cut up and it mix them into the soil a little better. Remember again, when you're doing the secondary tillage, we, 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 we're making the, the clumps even smaller, you're breaking up the soil into even smaller pieces. And so this helps to actually mix more of the organic matter into the soil. And what, this, uh, what does this do? Allows the root of the crop plants to penetrate easily and grow freely in the soil. And so, again, those are some advantages of secondary tillage. Keep in mind, again, secondary tillage is about refining what primary tillage did. So, primary, primary tillage leaves the, 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 the soil with some large clods or lumps, and then secondary would break them down further so that you can obtain a, a better... A better um, tilt in terms of the, 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 the texture of the soil so that it can, of course, help the plant roots to penetrate more easily, help water to penetrate more easily, uh, mixing the organic matter more easily, the smaller ones, and produce the seed beds that you need for planting. So those are some advantages of secondary tillage. Another advantage of secondary tillage is that it might help with weed control because sometimes, you know, some of these nut grass and those things that are really hard to kill, they might escape the primary tillage because they might be existing in the big lumps, but they might come on secondary tillage now that can be even further taken out of the soil and mixed in. So it can help with the soil control in, 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 in production. The weed control, sorry, it might help with the weed control a little better. Because, you know, you get rid of more weeds that way. So there are a number of advantages, uh, reasons why farmer Garona might want to do her secondary tillage. Alright, so those are just a few. Alright, see, farmer Garona attaches a cedar planter to her tractor, which she uses to sow the bean seeds directly into the ground. So just four benefits farmer Garona would derive from the use of a mechanical cedar for planting her crops. Of course, the first one is... Time, right? Time saving. It will be done faster, 
right? It will be done faster and in a quicker time. So more efficient that way. That's one benefit saving time. And next benefit would be, it would be more accurate in terms of the spacing and everything. So it'll be more accurate to use a mechanical planter because everything would be laid out in whatever intervals. And so you're able to have more uniformity in terms of sowing your seeds across the land, more uniformity. And so those are two benefits right there. And it might save us some money, so it might be more economical because whereas she might have needed a lot of labor to sow those seeds, now using an, uh, me a me machine, it would she doesn't have to hire as much persons as she would have before. So it's more economical and it's more cost saving for going to use the mechanical seeder and planter. Last one we can think of is that, of course, mechanization allows the farmer Gorona to increase her scale of production. So she increased the capacity, she increased her acreage, she increased her scale of production. She can now do more, right? She can now do more, and that can lead to, of course, higher, say, higher profitability. If you get all of them sold, that can lead to higher profitability. And so we can see that using machines can help to increase her bottom line because she's able to scale up do more with what she has and so those are four benefits that farmer Gawona can derive from plant using uh, machinery in her production process all right and so that's basically it for section two coming up next we have section three so section three now number five on a recent field trip to livestock feed mill students were told that the feed mill produces production ration for many classes of animals. First and foremost, we have to define the term production ration. So production ration is food, uh, feed, feedstuff fed to an animal to enhance their productive capabilities, right? to bolster their, their productive capabilities. For example, if you want to produce more meat, then you feed them a particular ration. You want to produce more milk, you feed them a particular ration. Right? If you jump to our textbook, we have it here. Production ration is the extra food added to the maintenance requirement which is used by farm animals for productive purposes. Farm animals need the production ration to produce milk, egg, he or wool, as well as develop offspring, right? calves, lamb, kids, and build body mass. So you can see here, the aim of production ration is to enhance the productive capabilities of the animals. So it is food, uh, feed stuff used are uh, fed to the animals in to enhance their productive capabilities in a nutshell B farmer and they received two different bags of poultry feed from livestock mill with labels showing the constituents of the feed as presented in table 2 so we have the crude protein, the crude fat, the crude fiber, the minerals, and we have the different percentages right there. So which of the two types of feed is better suited for broiler birds at four to six weeks of age? Give two reasons for your answer. So we're talking about four to six weeks of age as the broiler. So we're getting them ready for slaughter, ready for, for, for their meat. So you want the meat to be nice, you know, you have it nice and lean and, you know, we don't want too much fat in the meat. So which is the best feed to give the birds at that age? So if we turn it in our textbooks, we'll see that poultry birds are fed starter ration from day old chicks until they are around six weeks old. And then for the broiler now, from the time they are six, they're going to start feeding them grower ration right they grow ration so help them get big and nice meat so that they can get ready for the slaughter right so that's fed grow ration from seven to nine weeks old and so if you look at this one here <clears throat> what helps with growing so we're talking about protein they need that protein to grow so that's feed b with a high protein content help them to grow a little better so again, I would choose feed B with the higher protein because the protein is needed to build that body mass, get that bird up to the weight, the, the, the good carcass, the good weight in the carcass, the good dress weight. So that's why you would add more protein because it builds it up to get it to good, nice market weight. 
Continuing, farmer Sunita rears layer birds for table eggs. She uses the equipment shown in figure one to prepare her eggs for market. State the name of the equipment shown. And so this is a grading scale, an egg grading scale, right? So you can you put this egg there and it's in the, it shows the weight and it tells you which range it falls into, which grade it falls into. So it's an egg grading scale. Explain why this equipment is necessary when preparing table eggs for market. Okay, because we know that one of the marketing activities is, of course, grading. And so you need to be able to grade your eggs so that they can be uniform in the crate and also so you can price them accordingly. So it helps with the pricing of your eggs for the market. You don't want somebody to go spending money and they open the crate and they have some tiny little pigeon looking eggs. Right, you want, you know, if you tell them grade A, you charge them a grade A price. When they open the crate, you see grade A material. So this helps you to separate your eggs in grades for the market. So you can market them properly. These are grade A's, grade B's, C's, these are large, medium, whatever. So it helps with the overall packaging of the eggs. So if we look at in our textbook, grading, grading is done according to color, size, weight, and damage. Eggs can be brown, shelled, or white shelled, jumbo, extra large, large, medium, small, and cracked. Grading is necessary for 1. Quality control, 2. Consumer satisfaction, and 3. Pricing. So all these are reasons why, because you want to put the best quality out on the market, and you want to satisfy your customers, as I said before. You don't want the customers expecting grade A, open to see grade C or B. You, you don't want them expecting medium and open and see large or small. And then the price don't, doesn't match. So all of those are how grading helps with the market. Right? Graded eggs are packed into egg crates holding 6, 12, 30 eggs. Each egg is placed in the crate so that the larger end is always at the top to avoid putting pressure on the membrane. So grading is very vital for the marketing activities of eggs. Farmer Sunita observed one of her workers washing the eggs instead of wiping them with a damp cloth. So there's two reasons why she should not, why the eggs should not be washed. And if we take a quick glance at our textbook, it says here, Eggs are then cleaned by simply wiping them with a damp cloth. They should not be immersed in water as it destroys the protective coating on the outside of the egg so it destroys the protective coating on the outside of the egg now what this means is that the, remember the eggs are also porous right they are also porous the shells are also porous and if you immerse them in water if you put them in water washing them <clears throat> they can water can seep through uh, the membrane because it's destroyed and that would lead to some spoilage some faster spoilage in the egg so the shelf life will be diminished in the eggs so in a nutshell, we'll say that one, it damages the it damages the protective layer of the egg, and two, it reduces the shelf life of the egg. So it causes when the protective layer is removed, it becomes more susceptible to infect bacteria and those things get penetrating the egg and causing the egg to spoil quicker and it reduces the shelf life of the egg so you should not really want to submerge the egg in water or wash the egg just like that just wipe it so that you maintain the the, the protective layer so the quality so the quality is diminished because the protective layer is gone and also the egg shelf life is reduced because it becomes more vulnerable to being infected with various bacteria and those things and it can cause foodborne illnesses when people consume that egg number six let's carry on number six figure two shows two types of bees found in a hive identify the bees labeled x and z x and z so we have the worker and we have the queen the worker and the queen all right so let's remember that the worker is the smallest and the queen is the largest and the drone is right there in the middle so what is the function of the bee labeled Y? So, bee label, so the one labeled Y is of course the drone. And its main function is to have sex with the queen and produce eggs. That's the main job of that bee. Right? The drone, fertile male, big broad body, well developed, function, mates with the queen. 
right that's the function of y which is the drone then next question farmer asha wants to improve the yields of fruits in her citrus orchard the extension officer advised her to establish an apiary in the orchard so just two farmer asha two benefits of establishing an apiary in her citrus orchard so of course the benefits of establishing an apiary you're talking about bees here so bees assist with, with assist with pollination and pollination leads to can lead to fertilization and fertilization can mean more fruit development right so it helps pollination that leads to fertilization and that would lead to more fruits so that's one advantage right there one benefit and of course the next benefit is if you're into into citrus orchard that can lead to increased money increased income right a better economic outcome because the bees help you to produce more fruits so you can sell more fruits and make more money so there are two benefits right there in establishing an apiary and of course not only the production of fruits but what's inside of fruit seed and so if you have increased food production then you have increased seed production so you can use those seeds to you know plant more of the the, the plants and also you, i mean if you have an apiary and honey is being made that's the next source of income on the farm right that's the next source of income so not only are the bees helping you with your orchards but you can also harvest some of the honey and sell it make some money extra money on this side so you have multiple benefits right there both biological and economical for having an apiary on the orchard farmer asha realizes that keeping bees is a profitable business and wants to increase the size of her apiary she decides to establish additional hives next to vegetable farm however she observed that the yield of honey from the hives next to the vegetable farm is lower than the hives located in the orchard so there's two reasons why the yield of honey in the hives located close to the vegetable farm is lower than those located in the orchard so off the top of your head one thing you can realize is that the vegetables might be sprayed with various chemicals pesticides and so those can have some drift and they can affect the 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 bees it can kill the bees and cause them to well if you have less bees less worker bees and less honey is produced so that's one reason why the yield might be lower and of course a next issue might be the accessibility access to flowering plants maybe some of the maybe you might be she might be involved in maybe monocropping and so you don't have that, that variety of flowers being bloom blooming or maybe they might be seasonal right they might not bloom around the same time and you know that might cause less production in honey but some of the vegetables might not have the flower the variety of flowers or the amount of flowers that the orchard might have and so you might have less access to these flowers and that might cause the honey production to reduce i mean also i mean it might be the fact that maybe the hives that she set up next to the vegetable uh farms are not established properly are not established as well as those next to the orchard or in the orchard so there might be a problem right they might not be well established there might be errors in terms of the management of those hives and that can lead to lower production in the honey so the tree i would focus on is the fact that vegetables are sprayed with chemicals that can destroy the bees and so if you have less bees you have less honey the even the same chemicals can be used on the flowering plants and they can destroy the plants or the plants just are not flowering as much as they can so the availability of more flowers is not there compared to the ones next to the orchard that can reduce the honey production also and of course the management of the hive maybe asha real didn't really do the same management techniques she used for the ones next to the orchard maybe she made a mistake here or there poor management maybe ignoring those close to the vegetable patch and so that can lead to less honey production so those are just some reasons that could cause reduction in honey production and then we have the last question for this paper c while inspecting one of her hives farmer asha observed that many of the sealed cells in the combs of the brood box are dark brown and produce a foul smell identify the disease from which the bees are most likely suffering and state the agent that caused the disease 
So that's one management practice that farm actually can implement to control this disease. And of course, if we jump to our textbook, we have it outlined right here. So we have foul brood caused by spore forming bacterium and so the symptoms larvae die within the capped or sealed cells of the comb which first become slimy then dry out and turn dark brown these cells produce a foul smell which gives the disease its name the disease can be detected by inspecting the combs of the brood for any discolored or brown cells the condition can be treated with antibiotics that are added to the hive but this does not kill the spores it only delays their growth all right so right they were able to see the disease name foul brood the agent is the spores forming bacterium and the management practice to implement the control disease is of course using antibiotics uh, added to the hive but like I say, it doesn't kill the spores, it just delays their growth, so that's managing it right there. But prevention and management, if you want to get into that, spores are resist resistant to heat, cold, and disinfectants. They remain viable for years in all combs, in honey and equipment. So you have to clean your equipment, make sure everything is nice and hygienic. The best preventative measures are strict cleanliness, regular inspection of the brood in the hive, and sterilization of all equipment, clothing, to be thoroughly washed in hot soapy water do not feed infected honey to larvae do not use secondhand equipment do not move combs from infected hive to uninfected ones all right folks so that's it for the may june 2021 cxc agricultural science paper 2 single award and so we'll try and see if we can complete some more of these questions but the only how you'll find out if you stay tuned to this channel like, subscribe, and of course, hit the notification bell.